Hi, everybody. So I'm really humbled to be here today. I don't want you to feel humbled and shamed, uh, but thank you very much for that darling introduction. So today I'm going to be speaking about exploring the new world, youth and digital culture. And that title really comes from American history, or really world history, I suppose. So you can tell I'm 14 years old and in 10th grade, so I have a lot of material to base this on. And probably most of you, raise your hand if you've heard this. This little rhyme before. Yeah, most of us have heard in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Maybe in that same unit with John Smith and Pilgrim dioramas. But what we don't hear in that pleasant little rhyme is really what happened afterwards. Because we're all supposed to know. Columbus discovers the New World, well, the Bahamas archipelago, and millions of American children can now be grateful to Columbus for a day off of school. But what you don't learn is that it wasn't all as simple as that, because Native Americans died of the smallpox that Columbus's men brought with them, and the explorers could be criminal and murderous to the local populations, and in return, in a rather appropriately vengeful twist of history, this is what you learn in AP US history, the Europeans, most historians think, got syphilis to bring back to Europe. So not exactly the stuff of the optimism of elementary school and dioramas. Now what does this story of exploration have to do with our story at all? Well, it's a metaphor. I think that most people would agree that we're on the frontiers of a new world of internet use and culture. We've already sailed the ocean blue with our phones and clouds and encyclopedias of knowledge in our hands. But my talk today focuses on how my generation is exploring this new world and asks the questions, will we play nice? Will we explore wisely? I recently taught a digital literacy class to a group of students in Vermont via video conferencing. And they were your typical affluent suburban group of students. They all had smartphones. They were all on Facebook. And they knew a few basics about what not to do on the internet. Post your name, post your address, right? But when I asked if they'd ever posted something on a social network or send a text that they would be embarrassed of or humiliated to see now or 10 years, 20 years down the road, everyone, including me, raised their hand. And I think that this shows a bit of a disconnect between what students are learning and what students need to be learning. Because it's one thing to use common sense and discretion when it comes to safety online, but it's equally important to take a long-term approach and consider the less easy to explain things, like your online reputation. And these were topics I brought up with these high school students, because there's no warning that pops up and says, how would you feel if someone interviewing you for a job 20 years down the road saw this? Facebook doesn't give you a pop-up with, are you going to regret this later before you post? If any of you here are inventors, maybe you can come up with like a filter that if somebody is in a picture doing something that they are going to regret, it will give that pop-up. But for now, we really have to be our own <laughs> privacy filters and you know, look at things and evaluate. No one would call Columbus, who achieved the feat of sailing across the Atlantic, a novice explorer. Yet when he arrived on this Bahamas archipelago, he thought he'd ended up in the Indies, which is why we still call Native Americans Indians, and that sort of rendered a lot of his navigational premise incorrect. In much the same way, youth like me and my classmates are pushing boundaries with our blogs and memes and videos, but sometimes, like Columbus, we don't quite know where we're going. There, we can upload videos onto YouTube in a blink of an eye, but they may be videos like those in the disturbing trend of girls as young as 11 uploading videos of themselves, going through pictures, asking viewers to respond to the question, am I pretty or am I ugly? And you can see that it has 5 million views and a majority dislikes. You can guess what the comments said. We can fill a Tumblr with pages upon pages of content, but that content may be questionable, like in the case of prolific thinspiration blogs that exist to propagate images that glorify dangerous anorexic skinniness and talk about having victories when you eat a zero-calorie lunch and work off most of what you eat. What is happening in the online world is affecting lives in the real world, yet often we don't think when we post or upload or download, that we are co-creators of the world we live in, too, and not just the one on the screen in front of us. But whether what we do online is good or bad, you can't argue that it's not influential. 
In many instances, youth are setting cultural trends online. Only in our time could a video of a teenage girl singing a heavily auto-tuned song, don't worry, I'm not going to play it, get more views online than the Super Bowl on television. And after going online and receiving more than a million views, my eight-minute TED Talk was really more influential than most of my writing, teaching, and speaking up to that point combined. This is leveling the playing field for access, for producing content, and for getting our messages out. We don't necessarily have to wait to be discovered by a TV show. And most of the time, we don't have to wait to watch what we want to get what we want either. In my own experience, I still love watching shows on TV. I tune into the nightly news religiously, but I don't have to wait for them. Whenever I feel the pressing need to indulge in the luxury and drama of British noble life, which, believe me, is a need as pressing as food and water, I can go to Netflix and stream Downton Abbey. Woohoo! Any Downton Abbey fans here? Yeah! Now, I'm so sad because they only have the first season. That is beyond the point. If I'm interested in content of a more humorous sort, or if I feel like procrastinating on my homework, OK, it's really that. I can watch YouTube videos with my sister. Wong Fu Productions is our favorite of us and about every other Asian person we know. I literally only know one person who is not Asian who is aware of the existence of this channel. But you can see it's very popular. Anyone here a fan of Wong Fu Productions? See some raised hands? Yeah. It's not all about getting laughs, though, because when we do finally get around to doing our homework, we go online. And we're in good company. Uh, Bill Gates said that his kids watch Khan Academy. Some of you are probably familiar with that. And when asked if he watched online videos, President Obama said that, yes, his kids recommend videos for him to watch. So you see, we're shaping what our parents are viewing. As such huge consumers of content, young people like my sister and I can have tremendous influence on the cultural landscape. You already know about Rebecca Black's Friday, but what about other videos or other means of contributing content online? Memes spread quickly on social networks, for instance. When I log in anywhere, this is inescapable. It will be uh, troll face. is just like pretty much a reaction to every single post. And if I tell my parents about this, they don't quite get why it's funnier. They don't really understand this world of images with uh, words on them. My mom was like, a mem? What is a mem? Which kind of proved my point. Um, and if I say something like, doing it for the lulz, FTW, they'll be like, what? And I, if I follow that with like just to troll, then again, they won't get it. When my art history classmate posts a reaction to this documentary about Caravaggio that we watched in class entirely in these memes, then my mom doesn't get why I'm laughing. But see that meme down there comes from the um, uh, I think the astronomer, and he was talking about Newton, and he had this really funny reaction to it. You should look up the video yourself. And so it's a cultural reference. I really have to refer my parents to Urban Dictionary in order for them to <laughs> understand that video, that meme, that so hardcore one. It requires a lot of looking up. Here are a few more memes that are pretty funny. Uh, this one, the top, Boromir from Fellowship of the Ring, and he's like, you know, one does not simply walk into Mordor. And, it turned into one does not simply do blank, blank. Uh, in this case, this is a reference to the delicious Indian dessert, gulab jamun. So one does not simply eat one of those, apparently. Art history hedgehog. I'm a huge art history fan, um, mostly because I'm learning it. So in these cases, it's references to art. Um, and then at the bottom, there's success kid, met an auntie, didn't get cheeks pinched off, I think, which I think applies to really a lot of different families, not just Indian ones, although that's where I got the meme from. So you see how these memes can just be created really easily. And I see them all over on my social network. It's memes like this that are instantly recognizable to a lot of my Facebook friends. Whether looking at, creating, and sharing memes, watching YouTube videos, or making them, reading celebrities' tumblers, or becoming YouTube stars, we're no longer just sitting back and waiting for grown-ups to tell us what to read, watch, make, listen to, well, have we ever. Time to do an audience poll about this, though. I want to see how you think of all this. Do you feel that online social media has created more distance between you and your kids? Raise your hand if you feel that online social media has created more distance between you and your kids. If you don't have kids, um, think of your parents. Has it created more distance between you and your kids or you and your parents? Either one. Okay, I see some raised hands, more distance. All right, raise your hand if you feel it's brought you closer together. I'm seeing a lot of raised hands. Wow, great. Well, this is really 
what I think of as the future because a lot of times when people think of technology and family, they think of people sitting in separate rooms texting each other when they should be talking face to face. But I think from the example of how you guys feel about your families, that this doesn't have to be the image of technology in families, that it can really actually bring people closer together. And my favorite comedy show, The Big Bang Theory on CBS, has a character named Raj Kutrapali who's always shown talking to his overbearing parents in India via webcam. I'm sure this is like too stereotypical and everything, but it's a really funny show. Anyhow, I saw that and I thought this is a great example of how technology is bringing people closer together. And this is a pretty obvious one, but when I was traveling with my mom and sister, because my dad is usually at home working, then we would always call him, and being able to like show him the hotel room, moving around the camera, or say, look at what we ate today, you know, um, just updating him on all the adventures that he'd missed out on. But it's not simply about communicating while someone's gone, which is sort of the most obvious example you might jump to. I think it really goes beyond that. I'm happy that my mom and dad are on Facebook because it means that they're part of a world my sister and I are already in. Sure, they might not get memes, but at least it gets them a little bit closer to that. And my mom and dad go about creating their social media presence a little differently. My mom is very active. She watches what she, we do. She logs into Facebook every day. She friends people. Now, I was okay with that, but my older sister, Adriana, is a little more protective of her privacy. Why, she wondered, does my mom need to be friends with me? and my friends, and my mom was enjoying her role as the secret police and running background checks on my sister's friends. <laughs> Not quite, but pretty close. In her defense, my mom said that she had to get to know people online because nobody ever came to people's houses anymore, and so the war went on. My sister didn't like that my mom was seeing her wall posts and relationship status, while my mom didn't like that my sister was chatting online when she could have been working on homework, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, my sister pulled the last trigger. She defriended my mom. And this obviously was not acceptable to mom. And again, as I said, we're the co-creators of the world we live in too, not just the one on the screen in front of us. So the happenings of the online world, this defriend, had an impact on their interactions in real life. It was, no, you're not going to that party until I'm back on your friend list. <laughs> Which is a pretty good incentive. So the two reached a conciliatory agreement, and my mom became my sister's friend once again. In turn, my mom hasn't done quite as much investigative work on every single new friend of my sister's, and I think my sister has taken a little more caution with what she posts, or at least she uses lists. Now, unlike my mom, my dad is a very, very, very late adopter of social media of any kind, uh, any adopter of technology, period. He listens to records, the things that came before tapes, that came before CDs, that came before iTunes. And despite the fact that he worked at Windows Mobile for a while, I know, I'm in enemy territory. He actually resisted getting a cell phone for many years. So he finally did get on Facebook two years ago. Sorry for all the Facebook mentions, Google Plus guys. Um, we're totally on it next. And what's so nice about my dad being online is that it's finally given my sister and I the opportunity to teach him something. Usually we're the ones asking questions. So it's really empowering to, for once, have it the other way around. They say that old dogs can't learn new tricks, but this has really been disproved in my family. He's a quick learner. So just as my mom is learning to maybe disconnect a little bit from my sister and I online, my dad is beginning to connect with us a little more online, and we've even gotten him hooked on Angry Birds. The funny thing is that my parents being active users of technology might actually equal more in-person conversation because suddenly we're able to talk about things that they wouldn't really understand before. We're talking, asking questions, and explaining things. At TED, I spoke about what adults can learn from kids, and the internet really provides a prime example. Technology provides a way for us to engage in conversation and learn from each other. You've probably seen Google's own Teach Parents Tech. I love that as an example. And the same is true for connections between organizations, companies, communities, and young people. The internet can empower us to do good by giving us effective tools or by providing these connections to organizations that we care about. Now when you see chats like, OMG, what's up, nothing much, the idea of kids using technology for social change may not be the first thing that comes to your mind. But many youth that I know are using internet tools to help them help the world. I'm organizing the Educational TEDx Redmond Youth Conference for the third year in a row, um, 2012. And it's an event organized entirely by youth, for youth, with all youth speakers. 
And our committee of 20 teenagers really uses everything. Facebook, Gmail, Google Docs, Google+, Skype, Wikis, YouTube. It's crucial to how we find sponsorship, organize and market the event, and distribute our talks. The event like TEDx Redmond really shows that internet or social technology plus kids doesn't always have to equal inane abbreviations and distracting chatter. It can equal good for the world. As a case in point, I started my YouTube teaching channel uh, very soon, actually at, right after I published my first book and began teaching in schools. And currently I've taught over 500 schools around the world using video conferencing. And I upload my recorded presentations onto YouTube as you can see kind of a little example there. And today I have more than 600 teaching videos on my channel. I see this as one of the best things about the ease of content creation for people my age, because it can turn a 14-year-old like me into a teacher with the world for my classroom. Some of my writing videos have received tens of thousands of views, and while I know that that may not be quite at the level of Rebecca Black's Friday, I personally think that one comment saying this was so helpful beats a few million dislikes any day. I'm not the only one uploading teaching videos online. Other students have also been teaching their peers as well. I think that this is truly ideal because you've all heard the teach a man to fish. He is fed for the rest of his life. Okay, I got that wrong. But um, I think that the idea with kids teaching other kids provides a more lasting form of learning and provides a love of lifelong learning and the realization that everyone is both a learner and a teacher. Being able to create content that's actually meaningful and helpful to a larger audience around the world versus handing a paper into a teacher where one person will read it and you'll get a grade. The trend of students making educational videos is catching on. The students making excellent math videos at mathtrain.tv are helping their math challenge peers, myself included, and getting valuable teaching skills in the process. And Cameron Manor teaches kids about germs in a Anyone fun, engaging manner. Germs. germs are not for sharing. Did you know that one bacterium weighing one trillionth of a gram can kill a blue whale weighing over 100 million grams? Such is the power of germs. <laughs> now let's examine the science behind germs. Before Antoni van Leeuwenhoek discovered his wretched beasties, or germs, under his microscope in the 1600s, we assumed disease was caused by either evil spirit or naughty parents. <laughs> You see, when King Tut died of tuberculosis at the ripe age of 18, his people assumed it was because of the sins of his father. In other cultures, where diseases were believed to be caused by evil spirits, demons would dance around the sick person and slather animal poo on his body. <laughs> there are actually four kinds of germs. Bacteria, which cause sore throats, ear infections, and cavities. Viruses, which cause chicken pox, measles, and the flu, fungi, which causes athlete's foot, and protozoa, which causes the runs. <laughs> Bacteria are one-celled creatures that get nutrients from their environments to live. So, but not if you don't mind pausing it right here. Some bacteria, like the kind you can find in yogurt, help break down the food and absorb nutrients, which makes you live longer. Great, so this is an example of Eva Reidenhauer, and she's an eight-year-old. You have to set a goal. Um, seems to be frozen. Well, this, um, this is an example. So what you just saw was Cameron Manor talking about germs, and this is Eva Reidenhauer, an eight-year-old writer. Probably reminds a lot of you at what you were doing when you were eight years old, making teaching videos. Mind you, where my story was going. For example, my outline for chapter one in Birds on the Run said something like this. Eva meets a hummingbird. We meet the bullies. And Eva protects the hummingbird from the bullies. When you're writing a book, you have to think about three things. Setting, characters, and plot. It's easy. Setting means the time and the place the story happens. Birds on the Run is set in modern times. It takes place in both North Dakota and South Carolina. So, I personally think animals. that this example, um, or the examples of these two videos of the kids at mathtrain.tv, um, all the kids making teaching videos, that this is really, um, next slide please, this is really way better 
than a viral video like David after the dentist. I mean, all that kid did was get high off of Novocaine. And look at these kids who are actually teaching, who are really putting effort into making something that, again, people around the world can benefit from. And beyond sharing knowledge and skills online, I truly believe that students have the insights to have meaningful opinions on education policy and reform. In the talk about new education models, you probably heard from a lot of adults, community members, politicians, teachers, administrators, but nothing from the students who are sitting in the classroom chairs. And I think that this is a fundamental flaw if we're ever going to have a really good discussion about what to do in education. So, uh, do you mind moving it to the next slide? The clicker is malfunctioning a little bit. And next slide. <laughs> okay, he's adorable, I'll give you that. This is facebook.com slash groups of the student union. Uh, again, Google Plus will be next. <laughs> um, this is an example of one of the discussions that we've started, and I think that one of the reasons that the student union is a really great group is because it's authentic student voices on education. We have adults who are on the group, but their role is to listen and to really look at what students are saying about our educational experience. So in this example, I'm asking a question about what do you think is being done right in education? We've had a lot of discussions about what, is, what has been um, done wrong, of course, and I'm seeing some really insightful answers. Students talking about how they really appreciate their vocational technology programs in their schools, or how they appreciate the wide range of opportunities for studying abroad. There's a lot of different ideas as to what is being done well, what can be done better, what we would like to see changed. This is another great example of a dialogue. Uh, what is a teacher? And my friend Hannah put, this is how I like to think of it. A teacher is somebody who's walking on a path seeking understanding. A student comes along and asks which way to go. The teacher points down the path and they walk together. A lot of people assume the teachers are already at the end of the road, but I like to think the road doesn't end. I think that is an incredibly poetic and lovely way to put the role of the teacher and to explain the role of the teacher. And yet, if you ask the teacher, what do you think a teacher does, I don't know if you would get the same answer. So I really like being able to see a student perspective in this. This is an example of a discussion, I know this is like tiny and impossible to see, this is a discussion around science, and you can see from the length of what students are writing, with capitalized letters, with long sentences, there's no LOL, OMG, IKR here. This is, um, these are important ideas, important discussions being started around things that directly affect us. So this is a discussion around science, this is a discussion around history, how we need to have textbooks that actually show where the United States is messed up which I think is important as well, um, and really teaching history interactively as the human story as opposed to list of dates and facts to memorize. And I really appreciate that we can do this because of technology, because some of the people weighing in, they don't live next door to me, they don't even live in the same city, they may be in India, they may be in Dubai, they may be across the nation, and this is amazing that we can have a big collaborative group like this, and I know that there are others getting started. And you might think, well, this is all very well because it's students working together, but I think that the same methods can work really well for adults reaching out to youth. As many parents or educators who deal with young people could tell you, we teenagers are notorious for how hard it can be to reach us, um, especially when we're sitting and looking indifferent with eye rolls. But this is really um, sort of a wrong image because with the right tools and methods, you can reach us very effectively. If you just think about the recent phenomenon of Coney 2012, the possibility of mobilizing youth involvement in huge social change and important causes online is something that organizations, large and small, are taking notice of. I'm a ambassador for the World Food Programs, freerice.com. I talk to students about this. And it's shareable, it's free, and it's easy to help solve a big problem with world hunger um, by answering questions, sponsors donate the rice. And many students have used this tool to great benefit to help the world. Anything that is fairly easy to use that we can distribute and share with our friends, that's good for everyone. And you heard about the Invisible Children's Coney 2012, probably the somewhat controversial nonprofit organization, but you can't argue that their methods were effective. I remember looking at my newsfeed as post after post poured in, and my classmates, my friends, people I thought maybe would never be interested in current events or charitable work were posting this video, and it got millions of views. Again, a great example of an organization realizing the power of youth and how to connect with us. Yet despite this great possibility for what we can do when organizations, when adults reach out to young people online, when I walk into school, everything turns off. Many schools take a highly restrictive approach to internet use 
In my school district, you can't access Gmail, blogs, personal websites, anything like that. And in some districts, you can't access anything that's not on an approved websites list, not even Google. To me, this approach is an extremely short-term one. I prefer the touch the stove approach. I remember when I was little, I was a pesky child. I always wanted to touch the stove. My mom couldn't discourage me. So finally, she turned up the heat a little bit, raised my chubby little hand to the burner, and I did not touch the stove again, I will say that. But the point is that I didn't get really badly burnt by touching it later. And I think that this is the same kind of approach that we need to use with the internet. Or if another analogy is the crossing the street one. Never teach a child to cross the street, and they won't know how to when they reach adulthood. So what we need to do, I feel, is to really emphasize education, long-term solutions. And if we really move ahead in taking this long-term approach, where schools aren't just blocking everything, but rather teaching students how to evaluate, then we can solve a lot of the problems where students are posting inappropriate content or getting in trouble in school for things that they're doing out of school. And in the same way, with the touch the stove approach, my parents were fine with my sister and me being on the internet at a young age. And even with us making ridiculous videos, uh, here's an example. OK, that's definitely enough. Now, we, we have hundreds of videos like this. The reason that that is the only one that you will be able to find, do not dare Google them, uh, is because we had to change many, many videos, privacy settings, to private. Was that an embarrassing, humiliating, horrible experience? Heck yes. Will it stop us from making worse, doing worse things in front of a camera during spring break in college? Maybe. I want to apologize in advance to anyone from YouTube for wasting your server space, and also my sister Adriana, who will kill me because of that brief appearance in that video. But the point is that we made these videos, we had the bad experience of having to take them down because now that we're teenagers, we're super embarrassed by what we did. And you can see from this example that we had really negligent parents. But I actually am glad, with hindsight, that we were allowed to do that. Because I think that it's the touch the stove approach again. We're wiser now. And we won't do worse things later. Oh, OK, instant capture. Hello, everyone. My name's Adora Svitak. And uh, what are we going to do? Can we like sing a song or something? No. Um, how about we do? Uh, Let's sing the cheer. Oh, this know. is on your account. OK. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, if this is on my account, I'm going to do a promo of my book. <laughs> Otherwise. OK, that makes me sound like a bratty, really like self-absorbed child who is obsessed with selling my book. That is not true. That is also from when I was nine, uh, 10, 11, something like that. And I still had my pudding bowl haircut. So um, <laughs> yeah, I think I've hopefully advanced a little bit. The point of that video is, well, it's one of our most meta videos ever. For one thing, we're talking about what to do on our YouTube video while in a YouTube video. And later, we watch a YouTube video. So it's kind of weird. But the point, again, with these videos, we made these videos. And we had the experience of thinking, OK, we're not going to do that again. We're really going to not waste the time of people who are viewing our content. And the internet was also crucial to my learning in early childhood. My parents, because of their uh, approach of, again, letting us touch the stove, were really fine with us being on the internet and showed us where to get good content, where to get good information, BBC schools, PBS kids. We sent emails. I was five years old when I started uh, my own email account. I know that that probably violates some law, but it, the point is that I actually learned good grammar, good writing, because my mom emphasized, again, even though you're online, you really have to make sure you're respecting your reader's time and using correct uh, grammar and language. And as youth, we have this increasing power to really chart the course for where we want to go next as explorers of this new world of digital frontiers. With a webcam and a click of a button, as you saw my sister and I do, and we can make a video viewable to anyone around the world. But as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, that power does indeed have a flip side. By putting yourself out there, you also make yourself vulnerable. One of my worst experiences with the mean side of the digital playground came from one of the best experiences in my life, my TED Talk. But I guess when you get one, over one million views, that there's bound to be some amount of vocal criticism. And that really hurt me as a 12-year-old when I was scrolling through the comments and I saw things that were unfair or unjustified. I was hurt. But I think that the point of what I did at TED was really that um, I looked at these comments, and I had a support system. My parents were there. My sister was there. And I didn't let it get to me. But I realized, imagine other kids, like that 11-year-old girl that I showed the snapshot of, asking viewers, am I pretty or am I ugly? The attackers there might not necessarily be just bored internet browsers a thousand miles away. They could be 
the girl next door, or some, a bully at school. And that's really what I hope to show other kids, is that what you do online affects what happens here. When you join in with our generation to create rules that make sense, you create rule followers and enforcers because we like what we see and what we're doing. We understand and support the rules and why they're there. Families can connect on another level with us using online tools, and companies, communities, and organizations can reach out to youth where we are. The ultimate goal isn't just to provide us with the most awesome new game or to get the most youth online. It's to help us help others, to really help humanity. That sounds like a big goal, but I truly think that it's possible. By providing the tools we need and the education of digital decision making, adults can help us be wiser explorers in this 21st century new world. Adults used to be the only one at the helm. I don't think this is true anymore. We, as young people, have considerable power now that we're on board. It may not be the 1400s anymore, but I believe that the beauty of this new world of online connections must be tempered by the realization that there are dangers seen and unseen, as well as tremendous potential for good. It's people like me and my peers who are exploring now with our creation and consumption at home, at school, at work, with things like TEDx Redmond. And it's up to your generation and mine to work together to ensure that we all explore wisely. Working with decision makers in education and communities, we can envision a better, more ideal new world of internet use. In other words, with clearer maps, better navigators, and wiser explorers, we may end up doing a little better than Columbus did all those years ago. Thank you.